Lover in Vita. Well, I was just saying that personally, I've always been very interested in how machine learning crosses over into the, the real, the physical, the tangible world. And so I'm very happy this month we've got two speakers who've taken time out of their busy schedule to talk about machine learning and how that crosses over into robotics. So Matthew is from King's College London and is going to talk about machine learning and soft robotics. Um, and also, just worth mentioning, Matthew also organizes a robotics lecture series at King's College. I'm not quite sure how you get on the mailing list. I know I am. I forgot how I got onto it. But it, it's really interesting. So people interested in, in kind of robotics research and what's going on, it's, uh, it's definitely worth uh, joining. Okay, anyway, thank you very much and over to Matthew. Right, thanks very much. Thanks very much also for the advert. Um, yes, we have uh, robotics uh, lectures pretty much every week at King's College. Go to my homepage. There's a link through. You can get onto the mailing list. We have a calendar and you can see what's, what's going on. So please do come along. It's open to all. It's free. It's in the middle of the day, so maybe some people will find that tricky, but, well, there you go. Um, so, imitation learning for soft robotics. I'm not Michael Howard, and I don't have strong opinions about the EU, so... Uh, <laughs> um, so, I'm pretty much a roboticist. I'm leading the King's Robot Learning Lab, and we sort of have a foot in both machine learning and robotics. I would probably say I have a bit more weight in the robotics side. These are a few kind of key words of what we're interested in, but this diagram really summarises it. We're interested in how can we get human, dexterous, compliant, robust behaviour from the muscles, from the joints, into uh, advanced robotic systems. So, so that's our main, main thing. Um, we are among many people in the robotics community who are interested in how we can get robots that imitate nature. And at the moment, there's a big trend towards soft robotics. So soft robotics are essentially robots that have softness built physically into the device in the same way that you do. So there's a guy, a friend of mine in Germany, he, he always demonstrates, what is a soft robot? Well, a soft robot is something you can do that with, right? And you don't break your hand. If you, if you do that with a traditional manipulator, something like you'd see in a car factory, you would either break the table, most likely if it's a car robot, uh, or you'd break the robot itself, okay? But we have tendons. We have muscles, we are soft, we're stretchy, okay? And that's what makes us robust, okay? So a lot of people in the community are interested in building robots that have that same kind of design, having muscle-like actuators. These are um, pneumatic muscles here. This is the uh, DLR handarm system that has something like 56 motors within this small part here um, that are controlling the compliance of the hand. You can hit that thing with a baseball bat and it, bat and it won't break, okay? But it's extremely difficult to control. So let me just give you a, a, an idea of, of what this looks like in practice. So what we're doing here is we're taking EMG signals. This is measuring the, the, the nerve innervation of the, of the muscles. Um, I don't know how much of a biological background people in this room have, but essentially it's measuring the, the, the muscle activity, okay? And we're feeding these into, um, we have a sensor on either side, we're feeding these into uh, this biomorphic robot, okay? So this robot has a little, two, little motors, two little motors here uh, attached to springs. And the nice thing about that is you can control independently the position and the, and the stiffness. Let me replay it. So you can independently change your, your joint torque or your position, and you can co-contract the two muscles, and that makes you stiffer, okay? And there's a lot of interesting issues about how humans control their muscles that we're trying to learn from. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people are interested in this area. One of the reasons is we're hoping to reproduce the human level of, of agility, human levels of performance. And another thing is that we're interested in safety. So at the moment, a lot of people are interested in having robots and humans work together on tasks. So similar to what you saw Ingmar talking about when you've got a, a self-driving car, you know, you're driving, the robot's learning from you. We're doing the same kind of thing, but with manipulators with arms and legs and hands and fingers and so on. 
Okay. So when we've got these questions, you know, uh, about improving agility, the question is, what are the control principles? What can we learn from, from how humans are controlling their muscles in order to make our robots do the same kind of thing? And the other thing is this programming by demonstration uh, issue. Now, when I talk about programming by demonstration, this is more or less what is current. So here you can see we're just doing simple basic lead through. You press the button, the robot's in teaching mode, you show it the movement like that, and then you press the button again, and then it manages to reproduce that same movement. So that's a, a fun little toy. We, we're kind of interested in tomato picking at the moment for reasons I won't go into. It's a little bit slow. Oh, there you go. Right, so you show it that one movement, and then it can do that 100 times, you know, 10,000 times. It doesn't get bored. Um, so this kind of thing people are very interested in in industry. But the thing is, it's, it's not that smart. So that's literally just recording and playback. So we want to go beyond a little bit and understand, for example, not just how do you do that thing in terms of just what are the positions, but what are the forces that we need to apply so that we don't squash the tomato? Or what happens if I bash it halfway through the movement? Am I going to get knocked out of the way? Is it going to knock me out of the way? Um, I don't know. So uh, really um, what we've come across is, this, is what we're calling this winning combination, which is uh, a combination of Compliance, physical compliance in the robot, so having soft actuators which are designed to have springs and, and tendon-like properties, uh, and optimal control. Okay, So this is the optimal feedback control formulation. Again, so you, you can just write it down. System dynamics is, is just a function. We have some control function. And then we come out with some optimal solution, which is crucially a combination of feed-forward and feedback control. And uh, there's recently been a, th a few nice uh, algorithms out there, such as IQR, Pi squared. These are uh, called optimal feedback control uh, algorithms. They're a little bit like reinforcement learning, um, and they give you this this solution uh, out of the box for free. And it's interesting because, firstly, it allows you to reproduce something about human behaviour, uh, which is this effort accuracy trade-off. Now, let me explain what that is. So let's imagine that you're uh, reaching to a target, okay? And let's imagine you're reaching, for example, to a broom or something like that. So it doesn't actually matter where on the broom you're reaching to, but it does matter whether you're you know, at the broom or not, okay? So you have redundancy in your target. So, you can, so essentially, um, you change your stiffness such that you are particularly accurate in the direction Towards the, towards the broom, and you don't care if you get knocked off when you're going parallel, parallel to the broom. And this has been proposed as a, as a theory of motor coordination. Um, and it actually falls out of the optimal control principles that you saw from, from the previous slide. So imagine, this is probably familiar to any control theorists here, imagine you have a simple linear system where you have a quadratic cost, and you can, so the cost function is up at the top there, and you can write down analytically the solution for this, which is this feedback controller here. So the controls that you apply are uh, dependent on your, your current estimate of your state and uh, this epsilon factor. And so this epsilon factor here, as it goes zero, towards zero, that's the factor that's weighting the um, accuracy uh, cost, then that, that dimension, um, in that dimension, you no, you no longer create corrections. That means you have no stiffness in that direction. So, so you can see that that falls directly out of, out of the equations of these optimal feedback control system. But the interesting thing is, sorry, I'll skip this slide. The interesting thing is that that appears when we, when we test it with people. So, for example, here we have a, a case where a person is reaching to this, this target, 
and he's holding on to this manipulator, this robot uh, manipulator, and that's applying force fields to him. Okay? And as he tries to reach, so in the sort of ordinary case, as you try to reach in a straight line, you end up you know, doing these fairly straight line movements. But then when you apply a divergent force field, that means when you go off slightly, you'll get a big force one direction or the other direction. Well, to start off with, you end up just going all over the place. But you train yourself up. So after a few trials of doing this reaching movement, uh, you start to return to doing these nice straight line movements. And what it shows is that you're, you're stiffening up selectively in these directions that prevent these perturbations, basically. So we can see that, that humans selectively change their, their stiffness um, uh, according to the particular task context. And this falls out also with, with the optimal feedback control system. So if we're, so this is, for example, some trajectories of reaching to a target where um, we've, we've done the optimal control. You can see the joint angles over time on this side. But here we have this antagonistic uh, muscle setup. And you can see towards the end, it co-contracts the two muscles. So it increases the activation of the two muscles, stiffening up and uh, that causes it to uh, um, be robust against perturbations towards the target end. So that's kind of interesting that this, this kind of setup allows us to reproduce human behavior on this quite fundamental level. Um, it's also interesting from the perspective of, of an engineering perspective is that because we have elasticity built into our joints, we can exploit this to, to make quite uh, powerful movements. So, let me see if I've got a video to show you what I mean by this. So, here we have, again, a robot with physical elasticity, compliant joints with springs Im embedded into it, and we've set it up to do this ball throwing task. So, this, um, this pumping motion falls exactly out of this uh, optimal feedback control uh, formulation. None of this is pre-programmed. All we give it is a target of how of throw the ball as far as you can, and this is what comes out. Now the interesting thing is here is the strategy of what it's doing. So I don't know if we can get a sort of close up. It has one motor at the top there, one motor at the bottom. One of them is controlling the torque, and the other one is pretensioning that spring. Uh, so this spring here. And it's basically pumping energy into that spring during the movement so that eventually it can throw the ball. Okay? So this is kind of nice because this allows us to manage energy efficiently and also it allows us to um, achieve high power throws with, with quite small motors. Okay. Oh, there you go. There's the, there's the close-up. So you can see this is, this is one motor that controls this pretensioning. This is adjusting the stiffness of the joint. And this is the other motor uh, controlling the joint torque. So this is, this is just some evidence about how that, how that works. But this is the plot that's quite interesting. So you can see here we're plotting power over time. And this is the zero line. Okay. So you can see that the energy that is being supplied to this, to this robot is 0, 0, 0, positive, positive, and then suddenly it becomes negative. Okay? So that's kind of weird, right? So why is that? That's because the energy is going into the springs for that period of time, and then it's coming back out again uh, once it goes back into the positive domain. And so it's building up that energy in and out before it makes that explosive throw. OK, so enough about, enough about that. What we're really, so what I really wanted to talk to about today was this uh, imitation learning programming by demonstration paradigm. So this is the standard setup for programming by demonstration, is that you have some set of data which controls, which can, contains states and actions, for example, trajectories. and 
um, what we want to do is we want to find some kind of policy mapping that tells us, well, given some state of the world, what are the controls that we ought to uh, apply at that time? Okay. But the problem is that if we have uh, compliance, then we have a very complex problem. We have very complex, non-linear, redundant actuation. You saw the two-muscle uh, robot. That's quite complex dynamics. And it's extremely sensitive to mismatches in embodiment. So, so, so this is just one way of designing your robotic system. And you'd think, well, in one case, it's kind of easy, right? So transferring the human behavior onto the robot, we already saw that, right? So we, if we design our robot so it's, it's biomorphic, that it has muscle-like actuation, then you can exploit that fact to um, directly imitate at the muscle level what, uh, what the person is doing. We already saw that. But the problem is that we, we generally we don't want to design our robots to be like that. So the biomorphic one is, is nice, but it's a bit complicated to build into a multi-degree of freedom uh, system. So you couldn't build a humanoid that way very easily. Uh, and so people are looking for solutions about how you can include this compliance into these more compact designs. So for example, this is called the Makepa robot. It uses just a single spring for adjusting stiffness. This is the same robot that we saw um, throwing the tennis balls. Okay, and that's nice because it's compact and it's easy to design into a robot, but it's not so nice because it's not clear from the human behavior how can we uh, get that robot to move. This is just uh, illustrating that a little bit more. So these colored plots here are actually equilibrium position and stiffness plots against the motor commands of these, of these different robots. So you can see, for example, here, as you co-contract the two muscles, you go along this diagonal line, and the stiffness increases in the antagonistic one. But when you go to the case of the Makepa, you have this very complex nonlinear um, setup for stiffness. So the question is, how do we go from, from the human to all these different types of robot? So I would say that in general, so there's not really a lot of um, theoretical work in this area. It's still quite open. But I would say that there's probably three main classes of approaches that you can, that you can take. So firstly, we have the direct, what we can call direct policy transfer. So we have a direct correspondence between the robot's action space and the human's action space, uh, and you just make that direct transfer. But the next thing that we can do is maybe go to a higher level and look at interesting features of the behavior. So we can take the features of the human behavior, such as the stiffness profile, the damping profile, and we can define equivalent features on the robotic system, such as, well, for example, in this case, we can adjust stiffness as well, so we can track the stiffness profile too. And we can see how that, that pans out for us. So this is what we can call feature-based. Who? Who? Sorry. I can hear the video playing, but I can't see it. Ah, here we go. So now we have Again, we've got the setup where we're measuring the EMG from, from the forearm there, from the antagonistic muscles. And in this case, we're defining the stiffness as the extent of co-contraction of the hand and the asymmetry as the, uh, the, the equilibrium position. And we're feeding these back um, to the robot. As references, so feature references, basically. So you can see we can do exactly as what we did with the biomorphic device. We can co-contract, we can increase the stiffness of the, of the robot, we can move left and right, but now we can do it all with a uh, much more compact uh, system. So this is what we call feature-based transfer. Uh, I won't go into the technical details about how it works, but essentially you, you need a model of your stiffness and your equilibrium position and then you can go into the velocity domain of those um, functions and compute control velocities that allow you to um, track those, 
those things. So that's feature-based, and that's okay in, in some sense if you've got those meaningful features, but maybe we can go one step beyond. So the third approach is what we can call, let's say, the inverse optimal approach or the um, apprenticeship learning approach. So I don't know how many people here have, have worked with apprenticeship learning, but what we're interested in here is that, well, how can we take a, a representation of the human behavior that captures somehow the goals or the objectives of what the person is trying to do, okay? So the, the setup is we take, again, recordings of the expert behavior, we feed them into an apprenticeship learner, and from that we learn the cost function or the reward function if you're a reinforcement learning person, and then we take that cost function and we pass that over to the robot and then we allow the robot to optimize that with respect to its own dynamics. Okay? So what that means is potentially the robot could outperform the person because if the robot's dynamics are more suitable to the particular task, then it's, and it will optimize, it will, it will potentially outperform. So that's kind of interesting and yeah, again there's lots of sort of technical stuff there but let me give you kind of a sort of intuitive example of this so imagine you're trying to learn this punching task okay so f let's say we've got uh you know examples of a human doing some sort of punching and you want to apply it to some uh, robotic system that has um stiffness and equilibrium position control again okay so the um, one way to do this is that we can define some cost, fun cost model. Uh, so let's say we, we care about uh, target accuracy when we're punching. We care about the sort of impact velocity. We can care about the uh, energy or the effort used during the punch. Uh, and we can basically, yeah, so those are the three main terms use these as features of our cost function, and we can learn the trade-off between them. Okay? And we can do this taking account of what the expert's dynamics are, and apply them to this, this uh, other system. So let me just highlight the fact that um, in, the, in the human muscle system, you have stiffness and damping coupled. So the joint torques that you have is a combination of the of the stiffness and the damping. Whereas in a robotic system, that's not necessarily true. So we have control of the stiffness and the, and the joint torques, but we have a, a constant damping. And so if you uh, apply this approach where you do the uh, inverse optimal control, the apprenticeship learning type thing, and we um, compare that against directly imitating on the feature level, so copying the stiffness, um, as we did you know, just before the video, um, you get quite different results. So in this case, we've plotted out red as the expert movement position and velocity and joint torques. And um, in green, what happens when you directly imitate the stiffness and the uh, joint torque? But we, um, you know, we we know that there's some difference in the dynamics there because one of them has damping coupled to the stiffness and the other one doesn't. Um, and what happens when we apply apprenticeship learning? Okay, and you get this very high oscillations in the case where you're just imitating stiffness. So I think the take-home story of this is that it's extremely sensitive to the mismatch in the dynamics. If you, if you want to just do ordinary, direct, feature-based um, transfer of behavior, okay? Whereas that's not a problem that we, we, we experience with the apprenticeship learning. So it's, it's kind of interesting in that, in that way. Okay, so just to say that we don't necessarily need a model of the uh, human dynamics to be able to do this you can totally throw all that away and use a cloud of, of data. So we can use model-free um, uh, reinforcement learning in place of, let's say, the optimal feedback control approaches and still get pretty much the same result. 
So careful consideration of co correspondence is the key. Okay, so, so those are some things that are kind of happening at the moment in terms of the programming by demonstration uh, and especially what's happening in terms of the soft robotics. I just want to talk a little bit about what's sort of, current, sort of um, coming up or what's next in that area. So one thing is that I've talked a lot about stiffness controllable robots, but you can also... Uh, oh. So there's also at the moment uh, a move towards in including damping into this. So this is a prototype device that we've developed, which is uh, a compliant Makepa robot, but it includes something a bit like a restorative brake at the joint. Okay? And so you can see that we can achieve different levels of damping there just through this ping test, right? So the number of oscillations will tell you um, how much the damping is. So that that's a totally passive device, and all it all that we have to do is we take a simple motor, short the two terminal leads together, and then you get get this damping effect. And if we change the resistance across that, we can change the level of damping. Okay. So we can actually suck energy out of the movement if we need to move rapidly to uh, a, a position. The interesting thing also is that you don't necessarily need to use damping to be able to do this um, rapid movement. So, so we can actually rapidly move to our target whether or not we have um, damping, variable damping uh, capability. But the difference uh, is that with the damping, we can instantaneously apply it. So we actually, um, so in simulation, you don't need the difference. But in, in reality, because the servos are slower, um, they're not as effective as moving, moving um, to, to break you, basically. So the damping is, is instantaneous. So that's one, one thing. Another thing that we're quite interested in is the sensing side of this. Okay, so I've talked a lot about actuation and controllers. Um, we're interested in whether variable stiffness is um, is important for uh, sensing. So um, one area that we are currently trying to investigate is whether we could use something like a little robotic finger for detecting cancer. Okay, so this here is a pig's kidney wrapped up in wrapped up in some cling film, but inside there we've embedded a little rubber ball, and we're basically running the finger over and trying to find where is the ball. And this is what surgeons do every day: they palpate parts of your body and they try to locate the ball. But the interesting thing is that. When you look at how surgeons do it, they adjust the muscles on their forearm during the palpation task in very specific ways to try to no locate the, the uh, nodule uh, more quickly. And um, essentially, as we've, as we've learned, so that involves, you know, that's actually essentially changing the stiffness of that, of that joint. And what we can see is that likewise with the robotic system, we can find a specific stiffness level where, um, where we get this response when we run over, run over the nodule. So there's something to do with the excitation and the information that you get in that, um, through that um, spring that allows you to be more effective and more sensitive uh, for these for these kinds of tasks. Okay. So the other area that is kind of coming up and which is which is kind of interesting in the moment is wearable uh, technology. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on in the lab is actually how can we embroider these into clothing to be able to get ubiquitous measurement of your muscle control. Okay. So we've got uh, digital embroidery machines sitting in the lab, and 
we've got these, um, what we're doing is we're sewing out these patches of conductive threads and um, we can actually build in uh, these EMG sensors into, uh, out of these materials. Let me show you a quick video. So we've built this little sleeve. This is about the size of a penny. And here you can see it in action. So this is the, the muscle activity being shown online. We also have motion sensors embedded into this thing. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting, that's kind of nice. And, we, and when we've compared this against gel-based medical electrodes, it's almost identical in terms of the response that you get. So it's kind of incredible that you can, you can just sew these things out. Um, but of course, there's some issues when you're working with clothing, okay? So one of the problems is that you, well, clothing is a very complicated system to, to model. You don't really know the dynamics of, of let's say, your shirt sleeve as it's, as it's flapping around. You know, when you move, it moves with respect to your body. Um, and, you know, the, the actual material properties of, of clothing is, uh, are quite hard to, to pick out from data. Um, so another area that, that we have recently been working on is how can we uh, extract sort of features of the, of the uh, human behavior ignoring all that all those motion artifacts all that noise and it's it's incredibly simple idea of what we're applying here so we're, we're trying to predict how the limb is moving from a sensed data and it's, it's, it's it seems to me amazing to me how much the machine learning literature looks at things where you have noise on the outputs but our problem is that we have noise on the inputs so it's a question about how to deal with that, okay? But one very simple way is to, to use orthogonal regression. So you're doing something like your ordinary least squares, which is you know, this one here. You're minimizing your errors in your, in your output variable. Instead, you can reformulate that so that you minimize your errors in, in all your inputs and output dimensions. And it's actually quite... We've been quite surprised about how... Um, effective that has been uh, for um, picking out motion and, and eliminating these artifacts. So this is our little experimental setup. You can see there's a box. It's got two identical accelerometers on there. We just do some random sort of shaking motion around. And from that, we build uh, a model predicting the, um, the box motion from the fabric motion. So the fabric motion is, is the yellow uh, signal there, as you can see. So, as I said, all it takes is a, is a simple modification of, of a standard least squares learner, uh, and we can get quite a close uh, match, close prediction of, of the box motion from the fabric motion, you know, purely from like half a second of shaking the box around. So, again, it's it seems like a, an incredibly challenging problem, but actually quite simple methods have, have been we've, we've found to be quite powerful in this in this area. Um, and so, what that has now allowed us to do is to uh, take motion analysis outside of the lab. So we can now. So what we have now is a pair of jogging leggings. We have men's, men's and women's are available. Um, and we've been quite uh, interested in what can we see from your muscle data as you're running around outdoors, okay? Um, so we haven't quite gone to the full, you know, LiDAR um, setup for these guys, but we're at least measuring their, their, their leg muscles. Um, and we're sending them around Hyde Park. And the nice thing about Hyde Park is that it has the rotten road which is where you train your horses. But it's also where we train our undergrads to run along sand tracks. Um, so, 
so we've 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 looked at this. We've got people running on on the rotten road. We've got people running on on sort of the standard uh, you know tarmac uh, tracks, and we've also looked at people running around like a proper athletics track with a proper spring base. And despite the fact that this is a nasty sort of knock together prototype system, we can see a difference. We can see a difference in the level of muscle fatigue that people exhibit when they're running on these, on these different tracks. So um, essentially what you need to look at is how the muscle recruitment increases over time. So there's some specific uh, physiological factors about why that happens when you get more fatigued. But we do see that uh, running on sand is more exhausting, as you expect, than running on an athletics track. So that's kind of a nice result. OK. so. So those are just a few kind of thoughts and ideas. Um, so I'm very much sold by this idea of optimal feedback control and variable impedance actuators. Um, they both predict the way that people are behaving, but they also have some nice properties that we can exploit in an engineering sense. Um, for imitation learning, it's really challenging in this area because of the complexity and the sensitivity of the dynamics of these systems. But I think uh, you know we're making some headway there, and you know this is what is is really you know at the at this current state of the art. It's where variable physical damping actuators, so including damping as well as stiffness into your into your robot, which is the same as as how what people have, and this ubiquitous capture of of behaviours, um, for example through through wearable sensing. So. I just want to acknowledge the many people who are not all pictured here and the many sort of organizations that, that have kind of sponsored this, this work. And I'll say thank you. For your uh, compliance stuff, if you've got a full mathematical model of the, uh, the way you want it to be, can't you simulate all of your springs and dampers uh, and then, uh, then just apply that in software with, with various sensors to, uh, to provide the, the necessary torque inputs? Um, yes, the answer is yes, if you have a full mathematical model of all of those things, but you don't. <laughs> That's the problem. So it's really hard, for example, to measure friction, and you know the manufacture of, of these of these systems is not perfect. So, in theory, yes, but in practice, no. Uh, it seems like in the imitation learning problem, a big part of the the, the difficulty is modelling the, the reward or cost function between what your your imitator is doing and the kind of thing you're actually trying to get it to imitate. So, but, but the actual control problem is actually not as complex. Is that, what, one, is that correct? And is there, are there any things that you've tried to kind of get around the modeling of the cost function? Um, so, it's, so it's not a trivial problem to go from a cost function to create a controller from it, firstly, especially when you start to have, you know, full humanoid scale um, uh, motors. But you know that's an aside. Let's assume that the problem is solved. The cost function, uh, in some sense, it's a bit easier because so our approach throughout has been to make things interpretable and you know, understandable. So, so we design our cost function to have meaningful features. If you want to go to a, you can you know, apply a free-form, you know, non-parametric model of your cost function. But so far, I haven't been convinced by any methods that, that are able to learn that free-form cost function model effectively. Um, and there's some, you know, good reason for that. One of the reasons is that it's actually an ill-posed problem. So the uh, zero cost function, no cost for anything, means that everything's optimal with respect to the zero cost function. So there's one cost function that every behavior can be explained by, basically. Um, so, so I think that 
at least from our perspective, because we're working in a very specific you know, domain, we're very much you know, interested in human, human control and we know something about how humans are doing things, we can use that you know, domain knowledge, essentially. Um, I'm not yet convinced by a totally free-form, data-driven thing for that. Any questions? Yeah? Just want to ask you, um, you use spring to damp. Spring, you use spring in your damping system. We don't use springs to damp, but we can. Okay, because from your um, videos and some other things, I can see that you are spraying to, to initiate those damping. Uh, I just want to ask if you consider alternatives, like maybe fluid and everything. And most of this you've shown go towards haptic, am I right? Haptics, yeah. yes. Um, okay, so firstly, we, we don't use springs to damp, um, but you can control springs to have a damping-like effect. So essentially you can, um, if you imagine with a, with a spring, when you extend it, you store energy into it. And if we, while we're moving, de um, what's the word, contract it, you lose that energy and so that essentially allows you to damp in some way. Sorry for the feedback. Um, but we, we, so this uh, actuator that I showed is actually using something like the dynamo effect to suck energy out. So that's a separate uh, damper. Uh, what was the second question? I forgot. Um, I said, it looks like uh, a haptic system. Um, so with the sensing stuff, we are going in that direction to some extent. Because if we, you know, we want to be compliant so that we can interact with people. And if you're being palpated, you want to have a, have a soft interface to you. You don't want something hard, necessarily, you know, pressing into you. Uh, so yes, we are going in that direction to some extent. I'm not sure what I just said there. <laughs> Maybe one more question, and then we need to close. Okay. Going back. Hi. Um, just a question about robot learning. Do you really think that the best way to teach a robot is to get it to imitate a human? Um, I think that humans are the best example that we've got at the moment of being a, a fully capable um, at many, many tasks. So. Uh, some people, so the, there is a little bit of a debate about um, whether we should be bio-inspired or bio-aware. So should we directly copy the human or should we just know what they're doing but design it better? And to some extent, we, we follow that approach too. Um, so having decoupled stiffness from damping, for example, humans have damping and stiffness linearly related. And we can avoid that. We don't need that. So we can do better. Yeah. On that note, we can do better. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, Matthew. And <laughs> All right, I think the next meetup, we're not quite sure whether it'll be July or the month after. may very well be, well, it may even be earlier. But uh, in any case, thank you very much for coming, and see you in the next one. London Teamler, the Beaver. London Machine.